The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, welcome back. <laughs> it's it's good to be back. It's so different from all the other times I've been here, me- meaning my home office. That's How's right. it going? It, it looks different. I think you've got like your your hue magic lights at a different color temperature or something, or maybe you've got a you know a fancy, I don't know, vlogging light or something turned on. I, I don't. I am using Camo Studio, which Charles Pappert, former guest on the show, had recommended on Facebook. It's I'm just using my phone a, as a webcam, and when you get the full Camo Studio experience, you can use the light on your phone to fill in light on your face. Whoa, How cool is that? Oh, I see. I gotcha. I gotcha. And, and you know what, though? I'm going to uh, object to you referring to Charles Pappert as a former guest. I think he's a former and future guest of the show. Oh, that's, I'll have Charles on any any minute. I'm so happy to have Charles on whenever we want to talk to him. We should talk to him about Crank Anchors one of these days. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We should definitely, definitely uh, do that. Hey, uh, Ben, what's, uh, who's on the show today? Someone, someone I think you know, right? Someone near and dear to my heart, Judith Weston, the writer of, I think, the best book on working with actors called Directing Actors. And there's a new edition of the book that came out. And in fact, we are going to give away a copy of the book, I believe, signed by Judith herself. Whoa. Not bad. Not too shabby. Yeah. And how should we do that giveaway? Should we have people like go to our our Instagram, do something like that, find the Judith Weston post and comment about the episode? You can say whatever you want, but then we'll randomly select, uh, you know, we'll pick a number and we'll randomly select someone uh, inside the continental U.S. Uh, uh, Sorry, everyone in Madagascar who might be listening right now, but someone in the continental U.S. to receive the book for free. We'll ship it out on our expense and everything. Definitely. And I just have to say, though, Judith Weston is one of the best teachers I've ever had and one of my favorite people on earth. She's she's just wonderful. She's smart. I remember reading her book. I had already graduated from film school when I first got uh, the first edition of Directing Actors. And uh, I was doing a lot of theater at the time and I read it and it blew my mind and it changed the way I approached uh, working with actors and affects me to this day. And Judith when I asked her to do the show, she said, well, it's about your show's about cinematography. You know, I'm, I'm talking about directors and actors. You know, do you think it translates over? And I emphatically believe it does. Lots of cinematographers become directors. Lots of people who are general filmmaker uh, types will listen to a show about cinematography. I know I would. If we weren't making this show, I would be subscribing and listening to every episode. Uh, I am subscribing and listening to that. You know what I'm saying? And and I think that moreover, Judy has a lot to talk about in regards to the creative process itself. The cre- She has such a great grasp on how collaboration works. And I think you can extrapolate from the actor-director relationship a lot of the things that I would say I personally believe strongly about the director-cinematographer relationship. Hmm. You know, I would also say that there is a relationship that happens between the cinematographer and the actors as well. Big time. And I will say that I have been on set working as an AC for some some people who really didn't have those skills, who really yeah. didn't have the skills. There's plenty of them. And boy, did they need them. <laughs> boy, did they really need to uh, be able to interact with think, the actors better. And they, they probably would have uh, better careers and better work if they had those relationships. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, and this is the thing that, you know, we've talked about on the show, but I don't think it's nearly enough airtime between us or anyone else out there, is that the best way that you get more work is that you did a really good job and got along with people on your previous job. Yeah. And man, if you can't do that, if you can't master getting along with your talent, the people who you have to get a really good performance of, or if you just do it perfunctory, if you don't have a good relationship, man, that's that's really going to hurt you working again. That's really going to make it make it tough. And I completely agree with where you're coming from. And I think everybody could use to every everybody who works in the film industry, in my opinion, should read Judy's books, especially directing actors. She has another one called The Director's Intuition. That's also excellent. And I think people should read these books because when we watch movies, we're watching actors. Acting is the magic that holds uh, acting and writing are the are the magic things that hold a movie together. And everything we talk about on here and we obviously talk to, you know, uh, amazing cinematographers all the time. 
and and the way that they create beautiful visuals and stuff like that but no matter how good the cinematography is or how good the editing or the score or anything is if you don't care about the actors on the screen and and it's not well written you're gonna tune out you're gonna you're gonna zone out and acting to me is the glue that holds the whole thing together and understanding how a great performance is achieved is a, a, a lifelong pursuit frankly you're you're never going to get perfect at it and I, uh, judy used to teach classes out here she had a studio in culver city and i took a bunch of her classes and she would have you do a scene and then she would go up and kind of say what were you looking to do and then she would kind of show give you some ideas about ways you could have achieved that other than the way that you did and it was always eye-opening, and uh, it, it was one of the best classes I ever took. I wish everyone could take it. She does lots of seminars and stuff like that, and uh, the new edition of her book is uh, just amazing. So I hope lots of people go on our Instagram and comment, and uh, uh, one lucky person will get the book. But moreover, just listen to her, and uh, definitely check out this book. You can get a hold of this book anywhere in the world. I think it's been translated into God knows how many languages. I, uh, I, I can't say enough good about it. It changed my life. Wow, that that's uh, that's high praise, and I know you. You are not one to lavish that, you know, uh, willy nilly. So that that's awesome. That's great. Uh, uh, now I want to read it. Sounds sounds amazing. Hey, I think uh, you would love it. There's a lot of stuff that happened this past week, man. I mean, we should probably, uh, you know, for for close focus this week, we should probably dive into like I don't know, uh, Oscars or SAG Awards. What what do, what do you want to talk about? Well, I think that it's interesting to hear the varying opinions i've i've seen about the oscars deciding to uh cut eight categories i believe from yeah eight eight categories from the oscar telegast they're not going to be airing them at all and those are documentary short film editing makeup and hairstyling original score production design animated short live action short and sound that's just bullshit. I agree. <laughs> That's so much bullshit. It's like, you know, they, 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 they tried this with the cinematographers a couple of years ago. There was a big outcry. They backed down. It doesn't sound like they're backing down this year. It's like, you know, this is a self an industry self-congratulatory event. And I know it's out there for, you know, Joe and Mary in middle America who yeah. maybe doesn't necessarily know what, what all of these things are, but I'm sorry by excluding them, you pretty much make it impossible for a lot of people to even understand that it exists. And the people who then might be encouraged to actually figure out and find out or seek out some of this stuff. So yeah, I feel I, like it's, it's, ugh, I mean, it's short the, the Oscar telecast is always kind of a, an odd ceremony because it's, it can't, it, it takes itself a little too seriously. And when people try and shake it up, like when Seth MacFarlane was uh, hosting, like, I feel like it feels odd like when people are too uh goofy or jokey the people who are there are deeply offended because they're all movie stars and huge directors and those people take them they do take themselves seriously and there's you know in my opinion kind of nothing wrong with it but i do feel like it is the industry's day to like really bask in its own glory and when you know i, I saw like a criticism from kevin smith and a lot of people coming out saying like the new spider-man movie should have been nominated for best picture and i'm like eh, sure does that movie need the attention or are we saying that like that movie should be the we hype that movie up so that more people pay attention to, you know, power of the dog? I don't really know that there's overlap with that. I do know that like as as someone who went to film school and has made a lot of shorts, if you make a short film and you are lucky, like festivals talk about how they are Academy qualifying. And if if you're a short filmmaker and you get on the Oscar telecast, that will be the biggest thing that ever happened to you as a short filmmaker and short documentary. And, you know, frankly, editing sound like all, all these things are, you know, makeup and hairstyling. Like th these are big deal editing, uh, Come on. creative <laughs> arts editing. Yes. Editing is like is effing major, like yeah. major. It's like the you're 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 cutting out you know 50 percent of the filmmaking process if you get rid of editing it's like yeah i mean and you know i mean i guess the thing is like we want to make the movie we want to make the oscar telecast more engaging to people who aren't in the industry basically and good luck i mean like i would almost rather it just be more inside baseball and just be on hbo max that's right I, you know like i would rather i would rather they steer into what they are good at yeah, yeah, the the academy makes its money. They make its money from that telecast. That's that's you know the the single largest revenue generating uh, event for mm -hmm. them every single year, and so I know they they are probably pressured to 
<laughs> to make it shorter. Although it would seem to me the longer it is, the more ads they can sell. So, yeah. so I don't, I don't know. It, it used to be the most watched thing on, on television worldwide. And now, and now that's, I think not the case anymore. And because they had very low ratings last year, I think now they're like, Oh, last year's was uh, just the weirdest one of all time. Though it was like full COVID and yeah, <sighs> it was. For sure. And I'll, ne- seems- I'll never forget because I was so excited for Eric Messerschmidt to win. But then uh, Halle Berry, I believe, called him Eric Messenger Schmidt. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, I thought, I thought we'd never I thought we agreed never to mention that. <laughs> Sorry, Still, Eric. Eric, oh. Eric, Me- Eric Messerschmidt's awesome. And I'm so excited that he won. But uh-huh. um, and yeah, Halle I- Berry is forever embarrassed. I'm sure. I'm sure I- she's apologized. <laughs> you know, that or Catwoman, which which would be the. <laughs> biggest uh anyway but um she's still apologizing for catwoman (laughs) she is uh i i I was okay with catwoman anyway the thing is that like movies are less of a mainstream thing like theatrical movies when you look at movies like power of the dog the ones that are the ones that are nominated for everything i love power of the dog i think it's an amazing film i I, jane campion's you know a world-class legendary filmmaker and she's made a startling work of art but i don't really feel like movies have that place in our culture the way that they used to and it's probably a bigger conversation and a rant that i will easily be triggered into going on but uh, you know like when uh think about like in the 90s like when pulp fiction came out like pulp big fiction deal. big pulp deal. fiction yeah. forrest gump these were popular movies that average people couldn't wait to see and see again and i feel like right especially in the last two years with covid people aren't going to the theaters and you know sometimes i i feel like there's an ebb and flow to it sometimes the movies just aren't really on the pulse and in general movies are not the pulse of culture the way that they once were you know it's more like eight hour miniseries on hbo or whatever (laughs) yes or series on netflix like squid game I mean, it's yeah. like that that really became the cultural moment. And, you know, first time non-English speaking uh, performances won the, you know, best performances for a male and female in a TV series, which is like, that's huge. It's really huge. So, yeah. I mean, it, they, they they rewrote the rules of uh, of culture, although, you know, I think there's probably a fair number of people who watched it dubbed into English. So so what does that mean? So I don't know. Yeah. When people complain about the Oscars being out of touch, I guess I kind of in my mind counter like are movies what movies were not in terms of are they good or are they well made but in terms of what they mean in a culture that's saturated with video games and youtube and really well made eight hour ten hour miniseries and you know peak peak television there's so many things vying for our attention and especially over the last two years going to a movie theater was became kind of a dangerous thing and so uh things like and I'm not saying anything negative about it. I, I love uh, Joel Cohen's The Tragedy of Macbeth. I wish I had seen it in a theater. I watched it on uh, Apple TV when it was released. And it's gorgeous. The cinematography is amazing. But I feel like those movies are best appreciated in a theater. And fewer people have been going to theaters for the last two years. Maybe, uh, you know, crossing all of my fingers and toes that it looks like COVID is not going to be what it has been for the last few years. We'll we'll start going back to the theaters a little bit more. But it really did take movies like the new Spider-Man movie to get people in, in, packing into theaters. And we'll we'll see uh, this week as uh, the Batman comes out, shot by our very own Greg Fraser. That's right. Can't wait to see it. Well, I, I think we should probably get to the interview with uh, Judith Weston. Here is Judith Weston. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I am here today with one of my favorite teachers of all time, the woman who wrote a book that altered the course of my life. It's a book that I never stop recommending to people. I read it, I don't know, it was in the late 90s. It's probably right after it came out. And uh, as soon as I moved to LA, I took one of her courses and then I took some more of her courses and uh, and I just think the world of her and I think everyone needs to know her better. So Judith Weston, thank you so much for uh, coming on the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you so much, Ben. You're one of my favorite students, so it's really great to see you today. (laughs) It's great to see you too. Before we even get in, there's just a murderer's row of humongous Oscar-winning type directors who you have coached. Can you tell me about a few of them, some of the names of the people who our audience would know? Well, sure. I I probably should mention the name of the book. It's Directing Actors. Of course, yes. Yeah, and it's just come out this year in a 25th anniversary edition. 
So yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky. I've, I've had, I've met so many talented and wonderful, smart, artistic people. I always say to people who are talking about Hollywood and sort of dissing Hollywood, and I just say, that's absolutely not my experience of Hollywood. I've mm-hmm. really, Agreed. really generous and fascinating people always. And well, I should mention David Chase. You know, David Chase was the first person who, uh, oh, yeah. first uh, maybe famous person who took my class, you know, way back in 1998, I think. And he said to me, he really loved the class, gave me this great blurb that I used for a long time to get people to take my classes. And at the end of the class, he said, I'm so glad I got to take this class because I'm, I've written a pilot for a new TV show and I'm just about to direct the pilot. Oh, my head. <laughs> so, and I just don't want to fuck it up. So, of course, that was a soprano. So he seems to have gotten that one. OK, <laughs> that was very exciting to feel like a little tiny part of that. And then Ava DuVernay. Wow. Took a number of classes with me and always is uh, very generous with sending people to me. And Taika YTT also. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, because I saw your name, I think, in the credits of one of his movies. Yeah. He put me in the credits for Thor. How do you like that? Yeah. <laughs> no, that was very sweet. But. Yeah, I think he was, uh, he told me he was a little nervous because it was the first time he was uh, directing something that he had not written himself. He did okay. That that might be my favorite MCU film, actually. So I remember distinctly, and, and again, I, I was remiss in not dropping the name of your book, uh, Directing Actors, but we'll say it a few more times and also we'll say it in the, in the host wraps leading in. But I remember when I first picked it up, my first impression, and I, I was at like a Barnes & Noble reading, sort of towards the beginning of the book, you, you kind of talk about how as a filmmaker, you write your script or you get involved with a script and you, when you read it, like a little movie plays in your head and your advice was sort of to dispense with that, especially when it comes to the performances of the actors. Can you talk a little bit about like how that tends to impact people? Because my first reaction was probably similar to a lot of people's first reactions, which was like, oh, I'm here to execute my idea. But I feel like what you brought me on was a search for a greater collaboration and a, and a better end product. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. Well, it has to do with a different definition of idea or a different definition of the idea of vision that it does seem as though a lot of people who, who want to make a movie they have this picture of what they want it to look like, what they want it to sound like, what the line readings are, you know, what, what, how the lines are supposed to come out of the actors' mouths and the expressions that are supposed to be on their faces. And they think of this as their vision. And I, I, I absolutely, I mean, a director must have a vision, must have an idea. They, they must. Everybody looks to them for it. And, you know, it's their job. It's their job to, yeah. have, to have a story, to be shepherd of the story and to have it mean something. My whole goal is to shift that way of thinking of your ideas or your visions into something that has to do with the subtext. What's going on underneath the words? What's going on underneath the plot? What's, uh, what's going on underneath the action? That there is a world underneath there that is the subtext world. And that's where your vision should reside. And it has to do with knowing what the story is about. And that you must know and you must be committed to you know, and ready to fight for when you need to. I just read an article this morning with an interview with uh, Selma Hayek, and she had just been in the the new MCU movie, The Eternals, and working with Chloe Zhao. And at one point, they'd gotten into big argument that uh, Selma Hayek, this is Selma Hayek talking about herself, so this isn't anybody telling stories on anybody. But uh, (laughs) there was something that didn't, that was bothering her. She did say what it was. And then uh, Chloe Zhao came over to her house and they talked for hours and they were very passionate. She said they were very passionate. She said voices were raised. People in the rest of the house were kind of nervous because voices were raised. <laughs> we were so oh, no. passionate. We were arguing. But they were arguing about ideas. They were arguing about, you know, they were both fighting for what the film is about. It's not a matter of the actor fighting for screen time or the director fighting for their ego that like, this is the way it should be because, because I said so, but that this, this is the way it needs to be because this is what matters to the story, you know, putting the work first. And that at the end of it, uh, Selma Hayek said that she was completely invigorated and completely happy. And she said, you know, if, if you have an idea that you want her to adopt, it better be a good one because she's too, mm. cause she's really smart. <laughs> And she's going to fight you on the level of ideas. So that's a big part of it. I want people to shift, to have their ideas be real ideas. 
of what the movie is about. I mean, simple examples like Francis Ford Coppola insisting that The Godfather was about family. That seems sort of obvious to us now. I mean, after, ever since The Godfather, all mafia movies have really been about family. But he was the first one. That was, it was unusual then. He, he got a lot of pushback from the studio for that. And for saying to every single person on the set every day, don't forget, we're making a movie about family. So that's an idea. It's also an emotion. It's also a, you know, a, a commitment, a, a spiritual commitment. And it's also very personal. And, you know, I think everybody knows that Coppola is a man who's very, very involved with family. And it could have been something else. You could have made, taken the same script and made a movie about corruption because there's corruption, all of, you know, corruption in high places and the police and the the government, corruption in business world. I mean, the mafia is a corruption of the business world, right? And corruption in the family, corruption in a marriage. You know, Connie's marriage is a real example of <laughs> corrupt marriage, right? So he could have made it all about that. And it's possible that if Sidney Lumet had directed the movie, that's what he would have focused on because he, he used to say about himself, that's my thing, corruption. That's what I, all my movies tend to be about. Anyway, it's not deciding what the movie is about. It's finding it. So one of the things I do in the book in this, my favorite chapter, which is chapter five on emotional event is I. And this is, this is a new chapter in the 25th anniversary edition of it, right? Well, yeah. Or it's expanded. Yes. It's very revolutionized. It's very, mm -hmm. I, I mean, in the, in my first book, which was came out 25 years ago, I did mention emotional event, but I didn't yeah. really delve into it. And it was only after teaching for 25 years after that book came out that I realized how directors struggled with that concept. It's a big struggle. Uh, and I, I was talking to you well, about you this. Tell me how that felt to, to, after, in my class, in my actor director lab, to mm -hmm. come up after your scene was presented. And then I would ask people, so what's the emotional event? And people would just start stammering. So, <laughs> well, and you, uh, this is uh, what we were talking about like before we started recording. To me, emotional event is like, it's simultaneously one of the most obvious things in most scenes if you really look at it and you're looking for it, if you really understand the script and you've really gone through it. But it's also, you know, when the sun's setting and you got to get this shot off before you lose the light, it's one of the easiest things to overlook and just kind of barnstorm past. And I think I was probably one of those people in the actor director laboratory who was kind of up there like, eh. Uh, because, you know, a no, lot of times... I don't times... think you were as much as the others sometimes. <laughs> but, but I think that, you know, sometimes I would choose... I remember I chose a scene from one of my favorite films, uh, Miller's Crossing. And it's like, I love that scene, but I hadn't thought about it on that level. And what it does is, in a sense, it reveals how amazing writing can be when it can really contain that. Also, it's one of those things where if the writing isn't good enough that it isn't there, it's still there. You still have to look you're like you're going to find it if you have two people in a room and the scene is not like purely expository and no scene should be. You're going to find it. But I have to say it's even harder than sometimes theme theme. I can find to be slippery of a thing to pin down sometimes. It's sometimes even harder to find that because also it might even change based on who your actors are. Of course, of course, it can change. Yeah. That's why. Well, that's why another big principle with me is to, in your script analysis preparation to use what I call the technique of three possible. So as soon as you come up with a great idea, come up with two more. You'll have your favorite. You'll have your favorite idea. But to come up with two more that could work, you know, you can think of it as a plan, a backup plan, and a backup for your backup. Which is always good to have. So the other two, they have to be able to work. You can't just come up with two other ones that could never work, like straw men. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not really backup if they couldn't work. Well, but, a lot of times when you when you go through that exercise, you'll realize the first idea was the obvious idea. And then you'll come up with a more interesting idea and you'll be like, oh, that's a cooler idea. Sometimes the opposite is the best idea. Yeah. But actually, uh, like if you could define for our listeners, like what is the emotional event? How would you define it? There are a lot of other words that are used for it. You know, the, the fulcrum of the scene mm -hmm. uh, or people call it, the, you know, the core, the nugget. The word that I think that I've heard that I think works the best other than emotional event is something that Ridley Scott says that it's the dynamics of a scene, you know, that, that he says something dynamic has to happen. There have to be stakes. And so that kind of the way he talks about it is similar to the what I have in mind. It's like something has to change and that has to matter whether which way it changes, that somebody will lose something. Somebody will win something. Maybe they'll both win or maybe mm. they'll both lose. You know, a simple example, a scene which is an argument, say, and let's say that one of the characters, let's say character A, has, uh, wants to pick a fight with the other character, 
And the other character wants to keep a damper on the fight, wants to keep the fight from happening. That's a very simple conflict. I mean, conflict yeah. is another word for emotional event. I like emotional event because it's something that happens and it's emotional. Yeah, I, I like the term emotional event because conflict is something that's happening always. Like there's always going to be conflict or, you know, some kind of oppositional forces in a story. Otherwise, why are we telling the story? But the emotional event is kind of like the, the reason somebody would say fulcrum is it's like it's the moment. It's the thing we're here for. It's when the shift happens or when someone wins or loses. And a lot of times it's kind of subtextual. And I think sometimes cinematographers understand this better than directors and sometimes editors and cinematographers because they just, they have to have the eye. They have to be able to see it. You know, they have to be able to put their camera on it and the editor has to be able to edit around it. That's what you're editing around is the emotional event, the central one, and then the little events that lead up to it, the little events that happen. But anyway, the sense that it ties in with the idea of, of the important tool for actors of having an objective, you know, something that they want from the other character in the scene. So let's say the, in the hypothetical scene I just set up, character A wants character B to fight with him and yeah. character B wants character A to calm down. Then there could be one decisive moment when that one of them wins and one of them loses, that the person who is trying to calm things down gets triggered and starts fighting, right? Yeah. That would be an emotional event uh, that character A won in a way because he got the other person to, to fight or yeah. conversely that character B could, you know, could, could be so calming, so rational, so full of unconditional love that character A finally lets go of his rage and they start talking like normal people. In that sense, the, again, the emotional event is a win for the person who wanted to calm things down. Or another thing is the scene can go back and forth. There can be a win here. You, you know, somebody's triggered, they start arguing and then they come to you know, come to their senses and start reasoning. And then they start, you know, it can go back and forth. And, and those are some of the ways that are very helpful to structure a scene is how things happen and how the relationship changes. That's the basic thing. How does the relationship change? And I go so far as to insist, to declare that there is no such thing as an exposition scene, that you don't need it if it's an exposition scene. There's still, even if it's only thing it apparently is, is an exchange of information. Character A comes into the room in order to give information to character B. I still always want to look for some kind of personal event between those two people. And it can be very small. And you can begin to find it by asking, who cares more about the other person? Well, it's very possible that the messenger is in a lower status than the person that he or she is bringing a message to, right? Maybe the messenger is uh, you know, bringing a message to a colonel or a you know, military person, and then the messenger is in a lower status, for instance. So the messenger has a little something at stake that they could be wanting to get a glance of recognition. Now, it could be that you know, the person who has brought the message, they're much more wrapped up in who the message is from, much more wrapped up with that person than with the person who brings the message, then it's a three-person scene. Yeah, when you, when you said that you don't believe in expository scenes, I'm like, well, I do believe in lazy writing and lazy writing often will go that way. But as the storyteller, as, as the filmmaker, the director, the DP, the actors, your job is kind of to find a way to make it, you know, to elevate any material. And it doesn't matter what, what you're given to bring it to life in an interesting way. One of the first things that I got from your book, and it's your move away from results oriented directing and moving towards kind of action verbs. And you even have like a suffix that's tons of action verbs. And I used to bring it with me to every set. And I, I don't know that I ever looked in it, at it in the middle of a shoot because I, I didn't want the actors to see the director looking through a, a how to book on directing in the middle of the shoot. But for my entire life, I've worked on projects. I've worked in advertising, for instance, where the client will literally say to me, I'm directing like a commercial project. And they're like, tell them to be more happy. And it's like, okay, my job is to figure out what that could possibly be and bring it to them because be more happy is a lousy direction. It's unplayable. That's what the first book was like. Yeah. The first book was more like that. It was more like, don't do this and, you know, yeah. use these tools. And after 25 years, I really moved away from that. I really, mm. because I found that people came to my classes 
And they said, I've got to learn the vocab. I'm doing everything wrong. You've got to tell me what I, uh, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? Yeah. Saying, I can't, I can't really give you do's and don'ts. But that, that what that list of result direction, and they're the simplest one, uh, you know, don't give line readings, right? Yeah. That's the, the, that's an example of result direction. Another example is telling the actor to be happier, be angrier, rather than looking at, at the motivations that are provoking that, you know, what the, the again, the objective that this idea of being angry or can easily be translated into punishing, you know, to punish yeah. the other, to punish the other character. Or to be happy, a uh, simple uh, translation to a verb is to celebrate. But I really kept trying to tell people, it's not a question of memorizing that. It, yeah, it yeah. really isn't. That was just an entryway, really, into this idea of why do you to get underneath, into this very rich and wonderful world, underneath the words and underneath the plot. And it's a more emotional world. Yeah. And not to think just about mechanistic ways. How can I translate this look I want them to have on their face? How can I translate that into quote unquote correct language? I mean, I'm not, I never, never wanted to be language. No, I, I never, I never got that impression. I think that like what had struck me about it at the time I'd read your book, I'd been in theater. I had been working in theater since I was 12 and I had been in, and I'd gone through film school. And I had never been given any language for how to talk to an actor. And when I was young doing stuff in theater, you know, just understanding and to this day, and I literally mean to this day, cause I was doing a thing today, you watch a take or you watch a rehearsal or, you know, you, you hear one version of it and you go like, what's not working and what's not working is kind of dancing around your emotional event idea within a given scene sometimes, or sometimes it's the actor is just thinking about it in a way that isn't exactly what tells the story the way you want to tell it. And, and it's, it's about it's giving not, them... It, yeah, well, what, often when the acting is bad, it's just something that I cover in uh, chapter two, this uh, in the moment that, you know, when the acting is good, the actor's in the moment. When it's bad, they're not in the moment. And they're either, you know, they're watching themselves or they're delivering a, a, a line that the way that they rehearsed, they were going to say it. They, they yeah. decided how to say it and they were, they're delivering that, that decision really. And they're not responsive to, to each other. And then in chapter three, it's uh, about listening. The, the thing that's the most reliable for an actor to be responsive to is, is another actor. And then that anchors them in the moment. And, and that's, that's what you're looking for. You know, actors that are alive, alive in their eyes and alive in their skin. You know, and I tried to talk about ways to look for that. Not so much to tell actors how to be in the moment because you don't have time to teach acting on, yeah, yeah. on the set. So it's more, you know, later on in this chapter eight, I think, casting, you know, to, to be able to train yourself to be able to find it in casting so that... It's such such an amazing chapter, by the way. And, you know, casting, another thing that like, I, again, in all the schooling and everything that I went through, I don't think that we ever really went over how to do it, even a way to approach it. It's really hard to do. Well, I did my very best to break things down so that they yeah. are teachable, so they're learnable, they're pra and so that you can practice them. Because, yeah. you know, directing is like the only field in the whole world where people think that they don't have to practice, that they don't have to train, you know, that directing actors, that they don't have to train. It, it's, it's a little crazy, really. You know, I, I sort of carry on in the rehearsal chapter about how I want to teach you not how to rehearse exactly, but how to, how to train yourself to rehearse, you know, get together with yeah. actors with no end product in sight, you know, with, as a learning session. Yeah. And find it, find a group of actors that, that want to work out like that and are, you know, are interested in it and, uh, and care about you, care about you enough to, to be honest with you, you enough to, to be kind <laughs> with yeah. their, with their feedback and practice and, and try seeing what things work and what things don't for you and for particular scripts. That's a big part of it is, you know, people say, I want to direct my first feature film this year. And then I start telling them, well, you know, because I do consultations with, with directors and I say, well, at the same time we're doing our consultations, I want you to start getting together with actors and practicing rehearsal. Yeah. And they'll say, oh, no, I don't need to do that. And I really, I really end up not really being drawn to work with those people because, you know, that, that principle is so important to me. It's like, if you, if you wanted to run the Boston Marathon, and you decide to read a lot of books about running, <laughs> right? 
or, yeah, or yeah. take a class with a with a running coach and, and say, you know, teach me over Zoom how to how to be a good runner. If you don't get out every morning and, and run, you're not really training. And I want to very much promote that idea for directors that you can train, that, that it is a craft. You can train yourself in these techniques. Yeah. You can train yourself in script analysis. The script analysis chapter, I used to scene from The Matrix. That's a big change in this new book. But, you know, they, they had a year to rehearse. Did you know that? I read this. Really? The whole movie? Or just like, I have okay. Darian Moss said they had a, that the actress had a year to prepare. And it was mostly, of course, to learn the uh, martial arts. But she said that Lawrence Fishburne took it upon himself to treat it like a like a acting class, you know, like a real him. like a real rehearsal of the scenes. And um, I mean, I think the directors were busy with other things, but but that they he sort of he sort of took over as kind of rehearsal master. I think that's that's the impression I get from from this thing that Carrie Ann Moss said. So that they uh, they rehearsed the emotional content of the scenes at the same time as they were learning the martial arts, which was also you know very important. But, uh, but you can sneak in things like that if you have that as a, as a priority. Oh, I only know one thing, very important thing I wanted to say to cinematographers. Please. You know, actors love cinematographers. Cinematographers know that. Actors love cinematographers. They make them look good. And they make them look good. And I'll never forget the first uh, or the second show I was in, you know, somebody came over to me and said... <laughs> I was so green. I mean, I'd done a lot of theater, mm. but I, I, you know, I was just starting to do some, uh, some film and television. And he said, you know, I want you to be able to feel this light on your face. You, you know, you need to, you need to feel this light on your face and you're, you're turning away from it. That don't do that. So, you know, actress loves the people that give them those little tips uh, and they're, they're often gentler than the director who can easily get to be a little bit on edge with all of the yeah. stuff that's raining down on them. To your point also about cinematographers and actors, like especially in our current day and age of video village, a lot of times the, the camera operator, if that is the cinematographer or they might just be an operator, is the closest person to the actor. It's the only person close to the actor who isn't another actor. Yeah, that's and, why I don't, get, I don't get video village at all. I just don't get it. I mean, I, I just think the director, why would you want to be with, why wouldn't you want to be with the people who are actually making the movie? Yeah. We're actually making a movie that's the actors and the cinematographer and the camera operator and the boom operator. Those are the people who are actually making the movie. Why wouldn't you want to be around them? You know, they're the creative people. Why don't you want to be around them? If you're making something that's very Wes Anderson-y where, where like every corner of the frame is so meticulously designed, I sort of get it. But at the same time, we also are living in a day and age where you could have a monitor and you could be right there looking at the monitor five feet away from the actors if you wanted to. Yeah, you can. You can't. You don't have to go to Video Village. You really don't. Yeah. To, in order to see the to see the whole frame. Now, I remember in your original book, I remember you pushing like, uh, and it, it, we were in a very film based world right then. But it was like, trust your cinematographer that they're getting the look and stand next to the camera and watch the performances. I know. I mean, I, I'm not as rigid about it now as I used to be. But and in fact, I had a conversation with a former student of mine, a director former student of mine who said that when he stands next to the camera, he gets so engaged with the actors that he, he'll have a sense that maybe it's not right, but it, it, he, he loses any kind of distance to be able to uh, tell them that they, you know, it needs to be different. Yeah. And that's not good. So he, he said, you know, that his partner had said to him, well, why don't you just, uh, you know, go back to uh, the monitor, or, you know, do it that way. Maybe that'll be better for you. So I said to him, well, sure, but here's what I recommend. I recommend that you try it, that you practice with it, practice yeah. with this, new, you know, figure out a way to jerry build that kind of setting with no money and see if that works better for you is, you know, just to, to stand yeah. farther away at the monitor. And if it does, then that's what you should do. But don't just wait till your next film to try that. Try it out ahead of time. Really, I think so much has to do with giving yourself more time to prepare, more time to practice. Literally this morning, I was directing something where I was able to have like a 30 minute chat with the actor beforehand, but I wasn't able to rehearse at all. And in fact, because it's audio, he's being recorded without any of the other any of his scene partners in the scene. He did have readers that I could direct as well. But I realized when you were talking about it, I was like, it, it was what came out immediately was that he was prepared. He's an amazing actor. And it was like, just let him let him rip, let him do his first thing and then adjust it from there judiciously. 
But to me, that that actually made the day possible, just kind of like rolling with his instincts because he is he was cast because he's brilliant. And you kind of have to have that trust. What's the point of casting if you're good, if you're, if you're good to, you're good to yeah. just before they do anything, uh, stuff them through full of instructions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you've got to cast people that you, you know, that you have a good feeling about their intelligence and their and their work ethic. You know, I feel like every once in a while, if you do it very judiciously, you can ask for a gimme and say, like, look, uh, here's exactly how I want this moment to play out. But I feel like like maybe once per well, project. If you, can, if you can anchor it to what the film is about, yes. you, you, will, you will get a better result. That's all. You could say, because this scene is an argument between two people who love each other so desperately that they will do anything to keep the relationship. And so for that reason, I think you, I, and I still think you could say, as, so for that reason, I, I think begging here is going to really be helpful. Yeah, I hear that desperation in your voice, but it takes practice. So can you talk a little bit about the collaborative nature of the relationship of the director to the actor? But also, I feel like it also applies having interviewed hundreds of cinematographers at this point. It applies to the DPs. It applies to like anybody who's in a position to make a creative call, which hopefully is literally anyone on the set. Like there's almost no one who's never going to have a creative moment or a collaborative moment. Well, be a better listener. That's yeah. a simple answer. I mean, I, I'd say to directors, listen more than you talk. Notice how much of the time you hear your own voice. Is it more than 50% of the time? <laughs> talk less. Talk less than 50% of the time. And, and ask questions. If you don't understand something, say, you know, tell me more about that idea. Oh, if you don't like an idea, say, I, I hadn't thought of that. Tell me more about yeah. that. Or if you don't understand it, say, I don't think I understand it yet. Tell me more. You know, so you get as much as you can from from other people, and and little weird things can come up that might be might turn out to be very helpful. I think that that's an amazing place to leave it. I think one thing I do want to see before we end up is for people who haven't read any of my books before, be sure that you don't accidentally buy the first book because it's twenty five years old. It's out of date. Don't mm. buy it. Don't read it. If you have that book and you're thinking about rereading it. Get the new one. It's uh, it's got this little gold seal on the front. So it's twenty five or twenty five yeah. years. And we will uh, we'll definitely put a link to it in the show notes. And for everybody uh, listening, that the book is directing actors twenty fifth anniversary edition. Please check it out. It's amazing. And uh, as always, Judith, your teachings are resonant and amazing. And and I hope that I hope anyone who's even curious about the actor director relationship whether you're a director or not but you're listening to this you're interested in filmmaking i i can't recommend it enough t- uh to check it out it, it's so engrossing and interesting and uh we're all about process here and it's like it, it's one of the best books i've ever read about a creative process well i love i love how you said that when you're talking to me about it you know that was about philosophy your, your podcast not just about uh technique and uh, and that's all I'm about now. You know, I'm gotten to an age, I've gotten to a point in my life where all that matters is to give out whatever I've got and to try to be helpful. So before we go, where can people find you online if they want to? Uh... Uh, JudithWeston.com. And from there, you can get to my like, social media and uh, yeah. you can find out you know, sometimes there are events and stuff and you can find out things there. Also on uh, under, I just got this organized this weekend, but under videos and podcasts, this is going to be on there. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So videos and podcasts, I've, I've got links to, and I've done a couple of uh, webinars. I did one for the Sundance Institute, which is three mm. hours long. So, mm. And everyone should check it out. Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it's free. Definitely, definitely check it out. So uh, uh, Judith, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it's great to see you again. I love the new book. Thank you, by the way, for asking me to uh, watch Alien so that I could report back to to you about Alien. You were so helpful. It was great. I had the the section. So people have to, that's in chapter five, the section on the Alien franchise. So everybody should check that out. Ben was helpful. You were like, thank you so much. And I was like, oh, you're welcome for me watching one of my favorite movies. Anyway, (laughs) thank you so much. And I can't wait to talk to you again. All righty. 
All right, so that was Judith Weston, and anyone listening to this, uh, go to our Instagram, and you will see the uh, the picture of Judy's book. Please make any comment on it, and you will be automatically entered to get a free autographed copy of Directing Actors, uh, the new edition. Please do it. She's awesome. Her book's awesome. Definitely check it out. Hey, Ben, you know what time it is now? Whoa, that was overpowering. <laughs> it's overpowering. What, what, what time is it? Just tell me. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell oh, you. No. Time to do an advertisement for our friends at DZO Film. DZO nice. Film, makers of uh, fine lenses for uh, content creation and filmmaking. Uh, very budget-friendly lenses, and they have some new lenses they call the Kata Zooms. Uh, the Kata Zooms, C-A-T-T-A, are full-frame zoom lenses that are really ridiculously inexpensive. You can pick them up for, you know, I think around 3500 bucks a pop, and they come in a nice two-lens set, and they come to a professional case. And, of course, you can get them over at Hot Rod Cameras. Hot Rod Cameras has them in stock. They've originally been shipped in the sort of mirrorless mounts. You can get it in E or RF mount and Z mount, L mount, X mount, but really E, I think, is probably the, the most popular. A lot of people have been looking for full frame zooms to go on to their Sony FX series and that sort of thing. But they do have interchangeable mounts coming in the not too distant future, I think in a couple of months, for PL and EF. And uh, the initial limited edition release of them is sort of a, a white, lightweight sort of composite material. So very similar to sort of the Fujinon MKX, if you're remember these lenses. These were lenses that were made for mirrorless cameras. But the next versions, the versions that come out in PL and EF mount are going to be metal. They're going to be aluminum. And so they will be a heavier duty one. But right now, if you've got something like a Sony FX camera or a, a Sony E mount camera, these lenses are super light. They cover full frame and they've got nice zoom ranges. And uh, I highly recommend uh, someone take a look at the 35 to 80 if they're looking for a zoom length lens in that sort of that range or the companion one, which is uh, which is a bit longer. That one is a 70 to 135. They're both T29 and really pretty impressive. And especially considering the money, uh, yeah, they're they're totally worth taking a look at. They might be the perfect solution for someone out there needing a full frame zoom lens. Sweet. That is awesome. And now, short ends. All right. So, Ben, it is our famed uh, short end time of the show. What is your obsession this week? It's a hell of an obsession. I know I, I built it up and I'm going to keep building it up. I have a, a love for films that take forever to make. And I know at one point I talked about the Orson Welles movie, The Other Side of the Wind. Mm. So this is a documentary called Kurt Vonnegut Unstuck in Time that finally dropped on Hulu last week. And uh, I have been aware of this film for uh, for a minute, probably for about five or six years. And it's because I had directed that play adaptation of the Vonnegut book, uh, The Sirens of Titan, back several years ago. And uh, in that time, I was reaching out to anyone who had anything Vonnegut. And there was a guy named Bob Weedy, Robert Weedy, who, if his name sounds familiar to you, he's he won an Emmy for directing Curb Your Enthusiasm. But in 1982, he was a very young filmmaker who had made one documentary about the Marx Brothers and decided he wanted to make a documentary about Vonnegut, Kurt Vonnegut, reached out to Vonnegut. Vonnegut said, sure thing, I saw your Marx Brothers documentary, let's do it. And thus began an odyssey of like 30 something years of him filming Vonnegut. And Vonnegut periodically would be like, hey, when are you going to finish this documentary? And he was like, um, I, I want to do it. And would just keep going. And he basically filmed Vonnegut until his death. I believe Kurt Vonnegut died in 2007. So it, it was in the in the 30s of years that he he was filming Vonnegut. And what's cool about it is as a documentary goes, it's like watching two friends hang out, like except one of the friends is Kurt Vonnegut. You know, in my opinion, one of the finest writers of the 20th century, uh, certainly the most influential writer on me. And you're just seeing him as a person. You're seeing him, you know, in a kind of a warts and all thing, like when he does stuff that's kind of wrong or gross or whatever. Uh, Bob was there to document it. And you sort of see the kind of, you know, how Vonnegut became like very important in the 60s. And then in the 70s, it was kind of treated like an old relic that nobody wanted anymore, even though he was still churning out amazing books, including Breakfast of Champions, that I think is possibly one of his best. And it's just heartfelt. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's sad. It really takes you on a journey. And Bob Whitey kind of takes you on his own journey while telling the story, because a lot happens, obviously, in his life between 1982 and now. And I sort of feel like 
documentaries that are self-reflexive to a point where the it's all about the documentarian, it can get old and it, it really works in this instance. Like, and part of that I'm sure is because he knows how to tell a story so well. He's been doing it for so long. He's made many documentaries and then also several seasons of Curb Your Enthusiasm. He like knows how to be interesting and entertaining and what to leave in and what to take out. I just can't recommend it highly enough. I, I feel like Hulu's kind of been killing it lately. And this is this is a movie that, you know, again, for like five, six years, I uh, I was aware of it. And I even reached out to Bob to see if he would come on the show and talk about it. And he, he sent me a very nice email response saying, like, thank you very much. But, like, I've been working on this thing for, you know, the last part of 40 years and I don't want to talk about it anymore, which I completely respect and understand. But I, I think uh, definitely check it out, especially if you're a fan of Vonnegut. You won't be sad. But even if you're not a fan of Vonnegut, I think it's the kind of thing that might make you want to pick up one of his books because you understand the power at that time that that a writer had. And total side note, by the way, when Vonnegut, I, I was really unaware of this. I knew that Vonnegut had written a bunch of short stories before he got his novel career off the ground. But did you know that in like the 1950s, you could make a living just writing short stories and submitting them to magazines? Yeah. Isn't it incredible like what you could do for a living and like actually just do that and make it <laughs> I mean, it's well, like that it's changed it changed amazingly from the 1950s the 60s the 70s and then jumping forward to today, today i think i heard something like 1974 75 was like the last year that you could have like a a, a pretty basic income and afford a house send kids to college drive a you know a, a basically a new car and and all of that is is gone now so now it's you need to have a couple of incomes not have kids it's a it's a very different world our cost mm-hmm. of our cost of living is is rough yeah. well what, what was interesting about it though is sort of understanding the culture of short stories like short fiction in magazines and it as, existed that people paid money for it yeah. well as it was replaced by television like as television became a bigger thing that people lost the interest in, in that but at that time in the 1950s TV was obviously there, but it wasn't like as big as it would ultimately become. And people were like Vonnegut in the documentary at one point. He said that like once he sells his fifth short story, he, he was going to quit his day job. Hmm. And, and I'm thinking like, man, if you sold five short stories today, I, I think you could go to Starbucks. <laughs> And, you know, it's really interesting because, uh, of course, television was replacing radio, uh, which radio was like uh, definitely a a hotbed for for short stories and entertaining stories and that sort of thing, uh, certainly at the time. And interesting that audio like podcasts, like what we're doing right now is sort of having this resurgence and coming back. But if you talk about if you talk about the money that goes into like, you know, the short formats and talk about the respect that like the Academy is showing short films and you know short entertainment it, it's it's interesting our there clearly there is a, a a thirst or a hunger for it out in the world to have that sort of entertainment and the monetization today i think is challenging to say the least challenging is a great way to put it but uh but anyway i firmly believe that uh when the right format or maybe the right methodology comes along uh that stuff will be there ready to uh ready to be exploited in whatever that is so that people can enjoy that short form i'm not exactly sure what it's going to be i th- i really thought that the streaming services might embrace it in some sort of like anthology format or something but it, it hasn't really transpired so so i don't know some stuff comes out every once in a while but but not the way it used I, to i always thought so. that like vimeo in in their over the top uh thing was going to make that a little bit more mainstream but and i feel like it's not not doing it it's just not doing it at any scale agreed we'll see what happens and uh we'll all pine for the days of when you could write a short story and you know quit your day job (laughs) and and make a living writing short (laughs) stories yeah so Ilya, what is your short end this week well my short end involves russia and the ukraine oh boy so Which, you know, I know we talked about how, uh, you know, it could be our obsession of the week that might not have anything to do with the industry. But this does absolutely have to do with the industry. It absolutely does have to do with cinematography. I want to talk about the Russian arm. Are you familiar with the Russian arm? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I am. But, But let's tell the listeners in case they don't know. I was just getting to that. It is a crane. It is a camera crane that is bolted and it's not just bolted. It's like, you know, semi permanently affixed. Oh, I I thought they just used duct tape. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely not. Semi-permanently affixed to the top of 
some incredibly sporty vehicle. They have like a Porsche Cayenne. They have like a you know, Mercedes. They have off-road vehicles. They have all these different vehicles that have this massive camera crane. And you got to understand like, you know, the danger and the uh, the weight of these these arms. They're, they're massive. They, you know, they're made of all kinds of metals and they have stresses and supports to make sure that you can put like, you know, a, a 50 pound camera on one end and have the counterbalance on the other. And, you know, some of these arms, they're telescopic, meaning that you can you can make them short, you can make them long. And the vehicles that they're on are designed to go like 90, 100 miles an hour. And the the guy behind the inventor of this is a guy named Anatoly Kokush. And I'm probably getting his name wrong, but I, I, I did the best that I could here. I did not know this, but Anatoly Kokush, who I always assumed was Russian, is Ukrainian. And their Instagram today oh, wow. uh, had, had, a, had a post very clearly that says made in Ukraine <laughs> and it has the Ukraine Whoa. flag and it has this thing. And so I, I know that there were, you know, Soviet and uh, Russian engineers who were involved in the project. But, you know, the guy who's behind it is Ukrainian and he has another big post here about we stand with Ukraine. So I was like, oh, that's really interesting because, you know, colloquially. This is known as a Russian arm, and I think that the industry just basically assumes that it's Russian. But uh, Filmotechnic, the parent company, made it very clear they're Ukrainian. And actually, I went to their website, and there is this, I think it's it's a little bit funny, it's a little bit clever, but actually every single one of their cranes is called a letter U crane. It's a U crane, oh, Ukraine man. telescoping, Ukraine telescope, Ukraine six, Ukraine five, Ukraine four. So I was like, ah, okay, that's that's really interesting. And I was I like, I mean, well, I'm not going to they- ding Ukrainians on a bad pun this week, but come on. <laughs> I don't think it's bad. I think it's actually it's great. I, and and you know uh, and and here you know uh, I was ignorant of this. I assumed that filmotechnic people were, were Russian because they call it the Russian arm. But no, it turns out they're Ukrainian or at least uh, mostly re- re- Ukrainian. And that Anatoly who who built this is Ukrainian. So it's like that's awesome. And uh, if you ever see those super dynamic shots in like movies like Fast and the Furious and stuff like that. Good chance they were using a Russian arm, but I guess now we'll be all be calling it the Ukraine. So <laughs> <laughs> there, there's something sort of like freedom fries about it. Like, you know, if you, you remember when we were upset at France and, you know, the, the, the Pentagon renamed the cafes. We were not upset at France. OK, yes. OK, OK. You, you well, and I we, were not. A- we, I'm speaking we as a as a, our our you know our government our administration sure. was, was upset at France and so they went they went and did the petty act of renaming their their French fries. There's something sort of about this, but it doesn't feel petty at all because of course it, it's really just clarifying and making like I, I have to admit I don't know how many I don't know how many Americans even really knew where the Ukraine was or you know what what the difference between the Ukraine and Russia was. But mm. I will tell you that people are paying attention now. They are really paying attention, and uh, I'm pleased that this little thing from the corner of our industry is actually getting it's getting some clarity and they're they're coming right out and saying hey look we're actually ukrainian and maybe from this point forward they'll call it the ukrainian arm or the ukraine arm or the ukraine like like you said i think they should call it the ukraine i think they should too which is great (laughs) so 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 ben uh i think that just about does it for our our show today uh where can people find you they want to they want to find you Uh, as always go to facebook and join the group needs a werewolf we're we're just chugging along and then on top of that go to benrockonline.com and you can find all my socials you can uh, watch my reel look at still images from plays i've directed i don't know whatever whatever strikes your fancy and uh feel free to reach out to me on you know twitter linkedin facebook whatever let me know that you're a listener to the show i always love hearing from people who listen to the show and uh Ilya, where can people find you uh, you can find me over at Hot Red Cameras, hotredcameras.com. We still have a few t-shirts, actually. We just found another box of t-shirts. So Whoa. if you uh, listen to the show and you're in the L.A. or Burbank area and you want to pop in and just say, hey, I'm a fan of the show, ask for a t-shirt. There's a good chance that we'll actually have, like, your size now, which is great because before we just had, like, a couple of women's sizes and they were really small. And now we have a supply of, like, sort of, like, normal sort of range of, of clothing again. So, uh, yeah, if you're in the neighborhood, ask for a shirt and you don't have to rudely demand it. I know you were thinking about saying that just now. because I, I was. Could, could I was, see the I was suggesting <laughs> that people rudely demand it from you. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, you know, it's something for free. If you rudely demand anything, you, you, you may not get it. But if you're, if you're just friendly and say, hey, listen to the podcast, could I have a hot ride camera shirt good chance someone's gonna go yeah no problem what size are you here you go i I gotta say i i have one of those shirts and i wore it the other day and it's uh quite comfortable you you guys uh, chose a very good t-shirt vendor for the actual uh t-shirt material 
Yeah, we went with the good stuff. We didn't do any Gildens or any of the. I can't stand those. They're like sweatshop terrible shirts. These are like some nice V mount. Uh, v mount. <laughs> I've got camera stuff on the right now. <laughs> v neck. They're V neck shirts, <laughs> and uh, they're like uh, you know 100 percent cotton, and I think they're made by Bella Canvas, which is definitely a little bit elevated brand. Very so very soft yeah. and comfortable. Yeah. The good stuff. Anyway, so that's where you can find me. Ben, let's thank some people. Who do we have to thank for this show and, you know, life itself? Life itself. Uh, this show and life itself, I would start with Alana Cody, of course. She's got uh, a steady stream of uh, new interviews coming up. Uh, there's one you're going to be doing in just a couple days that I, I can't wait to hear what you do. I, I'm, I'm very excited to hear the interview and I'm, I'm angry that I can't be a part of it. She's the best. And we should also thank Ben Katz, the editor, who I hope we didn't make his life too hard today. Not eh, we, we, not too much fumfering and uh, whatever. But Ben's our amazing editor. Always makes us sound like not imbeciles somehow. <laughs> uh, ben Katz actually out doing audio, out re- working on a film this uh, this past weekend. He, he, he sent me a thing today saying like, oh, I can't come into work. I, I you know, I was... <laughs> Didn't like location audio, was, like, like he, he was, did location audio, like he holding a boom, a boom ball or something. He did that, yeah, he did that. He did, that. He did, did I think everything for that. So, oh, that's pretty was, sweet. Yeah, I know it was pretty. Congrats, that's pretty ben. blown away. Yeah, he's a you know, multi multi talented hyphenate there. So, and speaking of multi talented multi hyphenates, we have to I think set you up for that. Kay Zalatracci, who composed every scrap of music you heard on the show, but does so many more things. He directs, he color corrects, he does visual effects. Holy crap! There's nothing Kay's doesn't do. Uh, That's right. You can, you can check him out at musicbyks.com and uh, definitely hire him to score your next film project. And if you're still listening to the sounds of our voices here at the very, very end of the show, just don't forget that, you know, we love the people over at Assemble.tv. Assemble.tv, you can find a link to them in our show notes, which is over at camnoir.com. Don't forget to enter the Judith Weston book giveaway over on Instagram. And, uh, you know, just uh, pay it forward. T- tell people if you like the show, subscribe. You know, tell people that, that you like it. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll get a few new listeners. And that's that's always a good have, thing. Have we, and, hit a mil- have we hit a million downloads yet? Oh, I think it was like 990,000 something. Something what like when I checked a, you know, a couple hours ago. So I, I know we're getting really close. We have to have a little party or something when we hit our, we our million. We should. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Ben, I think that's just going to about do it for this week. Thanks so much to everyone out there for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.